I, I teach often in this room. Uh, what I teach in this room is a course for entering graduate students called Mathematics for Political Science. And so if somewhere in the course of this talk I lapse into a description of how you calculate the determinant of a matrix, <laughs> then you'll know that things are being a little confused. Because what I want to talk about today is the state of our politics in the United States, uh, and in particular the state of polarization that we're in in the United States. To talk a little bit about kind of what that's all about, uh, how it is that we're polarized in this country, but then what I really want to explore what the implications of partisan polarization are for the coming election in 2012 and for the time that we'll spend uh, with the new Congress and with the new presidential administration uh, after the 2012 election. As we enter the 2012 election season, it seems that Americans have never been more divided. Uh, for instance, the signature achievement to the Barack Obama administration, the Affordable Care Act, passed in 2010 with not a single vote on the Republican side in the House uh, and not a single vote on the Republican side in the Senate. That is, the, the, the primary achievement, one of the great achievements uh, of this administration was achieved entirely uh, with a partisan vote, a vote by Democrats uh, to pass the legislation. Um, last summer, uh, we saw uh, a conflict between the President and the Congress over the extension of the debt ceiling, the rise of the debt ceiling, uh, which led to a showdown, which almost <coughs> led to a, a decision to default on the U.S. national debt, uh, something that was so intense and so partisan that it gave rise to a public opinion poll, uh, which asked people whether they think that their elected officials in Washington have dealt with this crisis like mature adults, uh, or mostly like spoiled children, and as you can see, uh, most people said that our elected officials behave like spoiled children. Um, finally, we have seen uh, in the last couple of election cycles what I call the exodus of the moderates. Uh, that is, people who find themselves in the center of the political spectrum, moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats, deciding that they just can't take it anymore, uh, that there's no middle to work in, uh, and they would rather be doing something else with their lives. And so Senator Evan Bayh in 2010 uh, retired from the Senate saying there is too much partisanship and not enough progress, too much narrow ideology and not enough practical problem solving. Even in a time of enormous challenge, the people's business is not being done. And just recently, just a few months ago, Senator Olympia Snow, moderate Republican from Maine, resigned from the Senate or announced that she would not seek re-election to the Senate in 2012, echoing and almost in the same words, uh, the concerns that led uh, Senator Bai uh, to retire from the chamber as well. So it seems like we've reached a point in American politics where things, where we're, we're at each other's throats, where there's intense partisan polarization, uh, and where it seems that it's very, very difficult for the country to get anything done. So what I want to begin with is to give you an idea about sort of where we are in terms of partisanship in U.S. government, partisan polarization in U.S. government, I want to trace that to partisan polarization in the American electorate, then I want to talk about the 2012 election, then I want to talk about what comes later. Uh, the current state of polarized <coughs> politics in the United States government is actually a continuation of a, a gradually increasing partisan polarization uh, in government that has been going on most distinctly since the Reagan administration in the 1980s. Okay? What we see here is support for the president's policies by party, Congressional Quarterly, which writes on Congress, that's kind of a regular newsletter, a regular magazine on Congress. Congressional Quarterly uh, sort of traces the legislation that the president takes a position on, um, and then reports for each member of Congress uh, how often that member of Congress supports the legislation, how often the member of that member of Congress uh, opposes the president's legislation. And so what's shown here then are in red the support of the president's, uh, of, of Republicans for the party of the president, or for the, the policies of the president, and what's shown in blue is the support of Democrats uh, for the policies of the president. And you can see that they switch sides here, and they switch sides because the party of the president changes. And so over here, of course, we have Republicans being more supportive than Democrats of Eisenhower's policies, uh, and over here uh, we have Republicans uh, being more supportive of George W. Bush's policies than Democrats. So a couple things to note. Unsurprisingly, it has always been the case since the beginning of time that the president's own party supports the president's policies in Congress more often than the opposition party. No surprise there. The more important thing to notice is that the gap between the two parties' support has been increasing and increasing markedly over time. Really, again, beginning in the Reagan administration uh, in the early 1980s. 
Uh, what's uh, been the case is that the uh, support of the president's own party has been increasing, but even more dramatically, the, the opposition among the, pre uh, among the opposition party, the lack of support among the opposition party has been uh, uh, even more prominent uh, in causing this uh, divergence to occur. Uh, and so now we have reached a point where Back here in the Eisenhower administration, uh, there was only about a, what, a, uh, that, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of a 10 to 15 point gap in support between Republicans and Democrats for Eisenhower's policies in the 1950s, and that has increased now in the administrations of George W. Bush and Barack Obama to something on the order of a 40 or 50 percent gap in support for the president's policies uh, between Republicans and Democrats. Now, you know, why, has, why has this occurred? Well, part of the reason this has occurred is because of the regional realignments that we've seen in partisan loyalties. So what we had back here, uh, even say, uh, in the Nixon administration, uh, were uh, a good number of conservative Southern Democrats uh, who thought that Nixon's policies were actually pretty attractive to them. Uh, and we had a fair number of moderate uh, Republicans from the Northeast and from the Midwest. Uh, who were less enamored of Nixon's policies, even though he was the president uh, from their own party. So what lies behind this? Well, what lies behind this is the regional realignments have caused party prefer partisan, excuse me, policy preferences and the partisan labels that members of Congress adopt for themselves, okay, it has caused a closer correspondence between where people stand on the issues and their partisanship. So what's shown here, and this is based on roll call voting data, what's shown here is the distribution by party of policy preferences in the United States House of Representatives in the 90th Congress, which met in 1967 and 1968, okay? So on the left here, we have the Democrats in blue. On the right, we have the Republicans in red. As you can see here, even in the late 1960s, uh, the Democrats on the whole were liberal, at least moderately liberal on average, and the Republicans were at least moderately conservative on average. There were relatively few extremely liberal or extremely conservative members of the House of Representatives at that time, but most importantly, there were a lot of members of Congress who were in the middle. Okay, that is, there are a lot of fairly conservative Southern Democrats. These are mostly Southern and border state Democrats uh, among these blue lines here in the middle. And there were at least a, a modicum still of moderate uh, Republicans, most of them from the Northeast, some of them uh, from the Midwest. Fast forward 40 years, and this is the distribution of wow. policy preferences by party in the United States House of Representatives in the 110th Congress, which met in 2007 and 2008. As you can see, the Democrats and the Republicans have become more homogeneously ideological. That is, there's less spread of policy preferences among Democrats, and there's less spread among policy preferences among Republicans. Okay, so they've become more, more sort of uh, homogeneous. Each of the parties in Congress has become more homogeneous. The second thing to notice is that the Democrats have moved slightly to the left, and the Republicans have moved markedly to the right. Okay, and so the partisan polarization in part has been caused by a real rightward shift of Republican members of Congress um, in the House of Representatives. And finally, the important thing to notice is that there is no overlap. Zero, nil, nada, okay? There has not been overlap of, party pre of policy preferences between Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives since the late 1990s. Moreover, there is no overlap anymore in the United States Senate either. Okay, and that's been the case since the first, uh, I think the second uh, two years of George W. Bush's <coughs> term. Okay, so it's now the case in both houses of Congress that the most liberal Republican in the House of Representatives, the most liberal Republican in the Senate is to the right of the most conservative Democrat in the House of Representatives and the most conservative Democrat uh, in the um, uh, in, in the United States Senate. Okay. So why has this occurred? Well, um, and, and what are the implications for, for the election? Well, to look at that, we'll need to look at the way that these processes have played themselves out in the electorate itself. And what we're going to see in the electorate is that while the polarization in the electorate is not as striking, it's not as intense as it is in Washington, D.C., uh, the American electorate itself has also become more polarized. So for instance, um, here is a graph, and this is from survey data, 
uh, that basically charts the ideology of the United States uh, electorate. Uh, and the source of this is the American National Election Studies, the, the, the study of that Laura uh, mentioned that I've been involved with for quite some time, uh, which has been polling people since 1952 uh, and trying to figure out kind of how they interact with the political process in presidential election years. This is simply a seven point scale where people are asked to place themselves on a scale where the far left part of the scale is extremely liberal, the far right side of the scale is extremely conservative, and where moderate is, is marked as the center point uh, of that scale. So this is, I'm, I'm just using this as a kind of summary of policy positions. Um, and it's a, actually a pretty good summary of policy positions. So a couple things to notice about this. The first is that both in 1972 and 1976, when these questions were first asked, and in 2004 to 2008, the American electorate is a moderate electorate. Okay. That is, it is still the case, and it was certainly the case 30 years ago, that the, Ameri that the Americans see themselves as being pretty middle of the road in terms of their policy preferences, in terms of their ideology. The second thing to notice, though, um, is that the distribution has flattened out a bit. That is, um, there are fewer people who put themselves firmly in the middle, and there are more people who put themselves toward the extreme, and that's especially the case on the right-hand side of the spectrum among conservatives. Okay, so conservatives have distinctly sort of moved themselves to the right. <coughs> so how does that match up then with partisanship? Well, this is that same question divided by uh, whether people call themselves Republicans or Democrats. Another question that the American National Election Studies asked is a party identification question, which begins, do you consider yourself a Republican or Democrat, an independent or what? Okay. And so here, Democrats and Republicans are everybody in the survey who indicated any sort of affinity for being a Democrat or for being a Republican. Okay. That includes people who in that first question said, I'm an independent. There's a follow-up question that asks, if you're an independent, do you think of yourself more as a Republican or more as a Democrat? And it turns out that the people who think of themselves more as a party or identify in some way as a party, in fact, are the same as weak partisans in their political behavior. Okay, so very, very interesting. So independent is just kind of, well, I'm an independent, I vote for the best person, just so <coughs> happens the best person is almost always a Republican. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open minded. So, what you can see here in 1974 and 1976 is that it was not only the case that the American electorate was primarily or overwhelmingly moderate. But both parties in the electorate were overwhelmingly moderate. That is, the, um, uh, while it is the case that there are more Democrats who consider themselves liberals than conservatives, and there are more Republicans who consider themselves conservatives than liberals, it's also the case that the modal member of both parties, the modal identifier <coughs> with each party, was in the middle, considered him or herself to be a moderate. Okay? Now we're going to fast forward 30 years, and this is the relationship in the electorate uh, between uh, self-proclaimed ideology or policy positions um, and the uh, uh, and and, uh, uh, and their and the partisanship of, of each voter. As you can see, uh, Democrats have become a bit more homogeneously liberal. That is, there are more uh, Democrats, in fact, who call themselves liberal as a proportion of the party than before. Although the party continues, the modal category uh, continues to be moderate uh, among Democrats. But again, most strikingly among Republicans, uh, Republican voters have become distinctly conservative uh, in their political views. And in fact, this is, uh, this is kind of, uh, uh, what do we have here, moderate, and I can't remember, this would be kind of labeled somewhat conservative or maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, fairly, uh, uh, very conservative, and this is extremely conservative. Um, so we've seen a, we have seen uh, an increasing homogeneity in the electorate as well among people who call themselves Democrats and Republicans, just as we saw in the U.S. Congress. Um, and likewise, uh, we've seen a divergence between the two parties. The parties have become more homogeneously uh, um, uh, liberal on the Democratic side and more homogeneously conservative on the uh, Republican side. Uh, and this has consequences for the way that American voters look at the president uh, and look at the political process. So this is from Gallup. Um, since the 1930s, the Gallup organization has been asking Americans 
Do you approve or disapprove of the job that Barack Obama is doing as president? The classic presidential approval uh, uh, question, and this is straight off the Gallup website. You can, it's updated daily. Uh, you can you can get uh, this is from this is from March, so it's not quite uh, completely up to date. Um, but as you can see here, what we have is uh, uh, yeah, the uh, presidential approval percentage is broken down by party, uh, where once again red is Republican, blue is Democrat. Um, and as you can see over time, um, it has always been the case that uh, the members of the president's own party are more supportive of the president than members of the opposition party. So here we have the Eisenhower administration, for instance, where Republicans uh, were giving Eisenhower something in the order of 90% approval, and Democrats were giving him about 55% approval. Second thing to note is that the gap between the in-party and the opposition party has been increasing in presidential approval as well. So where, uh, for instance, look at the Johnson administration here. Uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, administration was marked by very, very high approval ratings at the beginning and a gradual slide, a very rapid slide actually, um, during the course of the presidential term, uh, owing to a whole bunch of things, Vietnam was one, urban unrest was another, um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but even through that time, in fact, the gap in approval between Republicans and Democrats for Lyndon Johnson's <coughs> performance as president was actually fairly modest, uh, along the order of sort of 10 or 15 percentage points. Mm -hmm. Fast forward now to the last several administrations, and you can see now that presidential approval uh, in the Bush administration, the most recent Bush administration, uh, the gap between Republicans and Democrats is on the order of 60, 65, 70 percentage points. In fact, by the very end of George W. Bush's term, 6% uh, of Democrats approved of George W. Bush's <laughs> performance as president, the lowest ever recorded, actually, for an opposition party uh, evaluating the performance of an incumbent president. And as you can see, the gaps between Democratic approval and Republican approval are likewise just as dramatic uh, for uh, Barack Obama. So what is this going to do for elections? Okay. What impact is this polar, partisan polarization that we've observed? What's the impact going to be on the elections? Well, here I'm going to make what may be a surprising <coughs> claim. A uh, surprising claim is that it's not going to make much difference. Okay. Sure, it's going to cause this election season to be very noisy and very contentious uh, and very passionate. Okay. But in terms of affecting the outcome, it's going to affect the outcome hardly at all. And the reason is that it turns out that elections are institutions in our politics that actually bring people together. Okay. They're the centri centripetal, is it centripetal to the center? The centripetal forces in American politics are US elections. I am a firm believer um, in uh, the proposition that presidential election campaigns actually make fairly little difference to the ultimate outcome of the campaign. And instead, it's really the conditions under which the campaign is waged that has the primary impact <coughs> on who wins and who loses in November and by how much. This view is called the kind of fundamentalist view of elections in America. Um, and what it does is to identify a set of factors which, based on historical evidence, most of it produced quantitatively, Based on historical evidence, we've shown that year in and year out, these are the kinds of things that have the primary influence on the outcomes of the fall elections. And those factors break down effectively into five pieces. One are a couple aspects of presidential performance, or at least uh, the, uh, the performance of things that the president is thought, apparently by voters, to have some control over. Okay. One of those is the condition of the economy, um, and that's something that's been getting a lot of play already, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in just a moment. The other is the condition of foreign affairs, whether the United States is a war or peace, what the overall condition of national security is uh, in the United States. There are three other factors as well. One is incumbency, uh, which will be important this year because in 2008 we had neither candidate running as the incumbent candidate. <coughs> this year we, of course, have an incumbent president running for re-election. What I'm calling the baseline partisanship of the electorate, that is going back to this partisan identification question, this is simply the proportion of the electorate that views itself as being a Democrat, views itself as being a Republican, or views itself as being a pure independent, people who lean either way uh, in uh, presidential elections. 
And then finally, the last of the kind of fundamentals is the positioning of the candidates on the issues. That is, whether, they're, whether they are located on the issues sort of close to where the electorate is or far away from there where the electorate is. So what I want to do now is just to go through each of these, talk a little bit about its significance in general for elections, but in particular to sort of show you sort of what things look like now uh, in 2012, basically six months out, five months out uh, from the 2012 uh, election. Barack Obama's big problem, of course, uh, is the condition of the economy. Uh, and we all have been seeing a lot of commentary on this. All of you know about the very, from the White House's standpoint, the very disappointing jobs report from Mitt Romney's standpoint, the uh, deliriously happy jobs report. Um, uh, what we know over time is that there's a very close relationship uh, between the state of the economy uh, and the fraction of the vote that the president's party wins uh, in presidential elections. This isn't just incumbents, this is incumbent party. Okay, so in 1960, for instance, Richard Nixon is the candidate of the incumbent party because he was running uh, while Dwight Eisenhower uh, was in the White House. What this shows, this is called a scatter plot. Each of these dots is an election year between 1948 and 1952. Uh, the horizontal axis is the change in real disposable income per capita. Okay, that is how much money people have, or, or the change in how much money people have to spend in their pockets once everything else is paid, once the taxes are paid, and so on and so forth. Okay, and on the vertical axis, we have the incumbent party percent of the two-party vote. So this is simply the vote for the Republican candidate plus the, uh, or, or the, the vote for the uh, uh, Republican candidate plus the uh, Democratic candidate in the denominator, and the numerator is simply the winner's uh, uh, number of votes. So it's the vote, vote share uh, of the major two-party vote. Okay, to give you an example about how this works, uh, this data point right here is George W. Bush in 2004. Okay, so Bush was running an economy that was growing at about 2.7%, and he ended up winning 51.5% of the vote. Okay, so that's basically how you read this uh, table. Okay, well, at the beginning of this year, the forecasts were for economic growth. The forecast for overall economic growth in the economy, which, which is pretty close to change in real disposable income, uh, was that it was going to be in the high twos, even approaching three. And as you can see, if you kind of bring that up to this regression line, which sort of summarizes the relationship between these two variables, if you bring that up to this regression line, that basically gives Barack Obama, you know, a reasonably good vote share. Uh, brings him in kind of in the 51, 52, 53 percent range. However, as a result of the last several of the readings of the economy, it appears that the economic growth forecast has been revised downward, so that now it is expectedly more near 2% of the uh, of, of in, in economic growth. And if you bring that up to the regression line, you'll see that that's a much more serious uh, worry uh, for Barack Obama. So something that started out actually is looking like it was actually heading in the right direction uh, for the incumbent president uh, has been lately uh, heading in the wrong direction which is why Mitt Romney wants to talk about economy, 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 and nothing else, okay? Um, the, the focus that Mitt Romney wants in this election is on job, and is on economic performance uh, because of this relationship. Nevertheless, all is not lost uh, for uh, the Obama campaign, uh, and there are a couple of ways that that plays out. Um, this is essentially a different kind of scatter plot. The vertical axis is same thing, the incumbent percentage of the two-party vote. Here, the horizontal axis is the approval of the incumbent's job performance. So this is that Gallup question again. Do you approve or disapprove of the job that Barack Obama is doing as president? And this is the reading that is most, that is closest to the election, but before the election rather than after the election. And so again, to give you an idea about what this looks like, this is George W. Bush in 2004. He was running with about 52, 53% approval. Um, right before the election in 2004, and once again, he got about 51.5% of the vote. Barack Obama's presidential job performance, given the state of the economy, has actually held up pretty well. Um, and in fact, Obama has been pretty consistently between 45 and 50% uh, since the late fall. Um, and my guess is actually that that will probably hold up uh, fairly well unless something really, really dramatic uh, happens in the economy. <coughs> and as you can see there, 45 to 50% actually puts him in a little bit better place uh, than the economy numbers would suggest. 
Um, so, you know, there may be something going on. We do have some evidence, for instance, that there are some presidents who are simply more popular than other presidents. People like them better. Eisenhower was one, Reagan was one. And then there are other people who are sort of underperformers in the popularity uh, contests, like Richard Nixon, um, mm -hmm. who uh, never seemed to be as popular as uh, what the conditions might have, uh, have indicated. Um, the other big problem that uh, Barack Obama is facing in his re-election campaign uh, has to do with the positioning of the candidates on the issues. Now, what this shows is the proportion of the populations, and this is again from the American mm -hmm. National Election Studies, this is the proportion of the population that says that I am closest to the Republican candidate or closest to the Democratic candidate on the issues. And what this comes from are from issue position scales where people are asked to indicate where they are on the issue and then where they see the candidates as being on the issue. Okay, so it's not asking them to tell us whether they're closer to one or the other, but it's rather sort of asking us to tell them where they think they are uh, relative to those candidates. And as a rough generalization, uh, first of all, uh, the electorate tends not to see over time very much difference between the candidates on the issues. Okay, there isn't a very close distinction really um, between uh, the two candidates. Uh, in the, in the uh, uh, electorate's mind, and there's actually a reason for that. You would expect that to be the case in a competitive election, that the candidates are going to be fairly similar to each other uh, in the positions that they pursue. But it, as you can see in instances where dramatic differences have been seen, for example, in 1972, Nixon versus McGovern, and in 1984, uh, Reagan versus Mondale, uh, the candidate uh, who is closest to the uh, electorate uh, has been greatly benefited uh, by being seen as closer on the issues to the electorate uh, than his opponent. Okay. The problem for Barack Obama is that the Republicans did not nominate Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich, Herman Cain, any of those guys who kind of went through the fall campaign and kind of sputtered out. They nominated Mitt Romney. Um, and Romney, of all the people the Republicans could have nominated, maybe it wasn't very deliberate in the end, but they managed to pick somehow or other uh, the candidate who has the best chance because of his positioning on the issues of defeating Barack Obama. Now, there may be a great deal of ambiguity at this point about where exactly uh, Mitt Romney stands on the issues. However, one thing I think we can say about it is that Mitt Romney's advantage in the general election is exactly the mirror opposite of his disadvantage in the primaries, which is that nobody really believes that he's as conservative as he says he is. Okay. And so Mitt Romney is seen by the voters as being fairly moderate, whether he is or not, who knows, but he's seen by voters as being fairly moderate, and so he stacks up quite well relative to Barack Obama in terms of his positioning on the issues. So these are all challenges for Barack Obama. Fairly moderate, uh, or at least moderate appearing opponent, a not very good economy, um, sort of middling level of approval, not great level of approval, not terrible level of approval, um, but there are some other factors that uh, work in Barack Obama's favor. Uh, one is the condition of foreign affairs, a traditional Democratic Party weakness. Okay, you'll remember that in 19, whatever it was, 1976, when Bob Dole was running for uh, vice president with uh, Gerald Ford, he talked about the Democrat wars. Um, well, over time it's been the case that uh, presidents who preside over times of war are punished for that. And in fact, there's actually empirical evidence that in 2004, George W. Bush ran worse than he would have in 2004 because of Iraq. Iraq was a minus for George W. Bush in 2004 and not a plus. For Barack Obama, we've almost essentially uh, drawn, withdrawn from Iraq already. The withdrawal from Afghanistan is announced and proceeding. Um, and there have been a number of successful foreign policy operations. The operation that took out Osama bin Laden, uh, the intervention in Libya, which of course is very loudly opposed by Republicans in Congress and turned out to be a great success, um, and uh, likewise uh, the uh, rather adept switch of sides in Egypt uh, as the uh, prospects for the preservation of the Hosni Mubarak <coughs> regime worsened uh, during the Arab Spring. In fact, I think there's a good argument to be made that uh, Hillary Clinton has been the most successful U.S. Secretary of State since James Baker um, in the first uh, George uh, H.W. Bush uh, administration. So whether whether this is luck or whether it's skill, somehow or other the Obama administration has had a pretty charmed life on foreign policy. Uh, this is not going to be something that's going to be a problem for Obama. In fact, perhaps a little bit of a plus. There are two other factors, though, that I think are uh, even more solidly 
um, uh, helpful to Barack Obama. One is something that I label a challenge that's turning into an advantage, uh, which is the baseline partisanship of the electorate. So once again, this goes back to the national election study question that asked people, do you think of yourself as a Republican or Democrat, an independent or what? And so these uh, up here are uh, the percentage of the population that views itself as being a Democrat or is leaning toward the Democrats. In red, the proportion that leans toward the Republicans. And down here in green is the number of pure independents. Okay. One quick point. You hear lots and lots of talk about how, oh gosh, there are so many more independents than there used to be. False. <laughs> okay. Independent actually peaked in the 1970s. It's been declining ever since. Okay, there are more people who on that first question will say I'm independent, but then it turns out most of them, in fact, four-fifths of them, uh, turn out to be, in fact, uh, partisans uh, in their actual orientations. Okay, so I wouldn't advise you to look real carefully at these absolute numbers, and the reason I would do that is because the American National Election Studies over time, um, they ask similar questions. Somehow or other, they tend to have a little bit more democratic response base than other surveys do, I would basically say that by now, the country is fairly evenly divided between people who think of themselves as Republicans and people who think of themselves as Democrats. And that has been the case since the Reagan administration. Right? There are some slow trends in these data, but the really sharp <coughs> break is in the first Reagan term, okay, when there was a significant shift away from the Democratic Party in terms of people's orientations as <coughs> Republicans or Democrats and toward uh, the Republican Party. Okay. Now, on one level, this is bad news for Barack Obama, because if he had been running for re-election back in the 1960s, he and his party would have had a much larger head start. Okay, um, And in fact, there is some nice uh, uh, data that sort of show uh, what effect this has had on, on our politics over time. Um, but in fact, there are some changes happening underneath these uh, figures that indicate a kind of movement uh, in the favor of the Democrats and uh, in that way toward Barack Obama's favor. Uh, one is the uh, rather dramatic, at this point, shift of the allegiances of young voters uh, toward the Democratic Party. So this, again, is the same partisanship question, only now going through time, these are birth cohorts. Okay, so for instance, right here, this is the cohort that was born in the 19 teens. Okay, and as you can see, almost 60% of them consider themselves Democrats, a little over 30% consider themselves Republicans, about 9% uh, consider themselves uh, to be independent. And so likewise, here's the most recent cohort, those who were born in the 1980s, who've now participated in three elections. Okay, and as you can see, what has happened is that the 19 teens generation was the peak Democratic generation. Why was that? Well, trace it out. When do people who are born in 1911 become able to vote? In 1932. What happened in 1932? Okay, the most successful Democratic administration in the 20th century was elected to office. Okay, this was the New Deal Democratic uh, uh, administration. Uh, and so that's the peak of the Democratic cohort partisanship. And as you can see, in every successive generation, up until the generation that's born in the 1960s, the very tail end of the baby boom. Okay, when did the people who were born in 1961 when were they able to vote for the first time? Yeah. 1979. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> okay, the most successful Republican uh, administration of the 20th century. Okay, so um, so we've we've seen a sort of steady move uh, away from Democratic partisanship toward Republican partisanship by cohort until these last two cohorts. Now, some of this won't stand up. Okay, I would expect that this gap is going to narrow. Okay, the reason being that partisan identification is still pretty plastic for people who are in their t in their twenties, right? It really becomes more firmly set when people enter their thirties. They take on responsibilities. They kind of settle into communities. All the kinds of things that kind of solidify uh, their orientations in politics. Nevertheless, it's such a dramatic break that I that I think quite firmly that there's really something there. Uh, and for the 1970s generation, in fact, that's, that includes five elections. Okay, uh, This includes the elections of 92, 96, 2000, 2004, and 2008. So we're talking about fairly substantial numbers of people uh, who are represented <coughs> in these figures. Okay. So young voters, uh, the young vote cohort, shall we say, seem to be moving in a democratic direction for the first time in two generations. Right, In every 
previous election, up until the 1990s, in every previous election, each of the new cohorts was more Republican than the preceding cohort. Okay, and now things seem to be turning around a bit. That's going to be good for the Democrats, including Barack Obama. The other thing that's changing is the demographic composition of the electorate. Okay. This is from U.S. Census data. Uh, here on the uh, horizontal axis, we have a census estimate of the percentage of the voting age population, that is, the population that is 18 and over, uh, who identify as Hispanic on the U.S. Census. Okay. As you can see, when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, that percentage was just barely over 5%. Okay. And those who were citizens were just barely over 3%. And as you can see, in every succeeding uh, uh, census year, the Hispanic percentage of the population has gotten larger, so that in 2010, the 2010 census found 14% of the U.S. population over the age of 18 uh, was uh, Hispanic. And the projections are for that to continue. Okay, so these are projections from 2008. They're probably overstated because of the slowing of immigration from Mexico and, in fact, some repatriation toward Mexico, so the numbers will probably be a little lower uh, than what's actually projected here. But as you can see, by the time we get out to the 2040 census and the 2050 census, we're talking about one in five voters in the United States is Hispanic. Wow. One in five, okay? And what is the implication of that? Well, for the last uh, 40 years, Hispanics have voted between three to two and two to one in favor of the Democrats. And so we have also uh, demographic changes in the electorate where the electorate is becoming more Hispanic and in that way, because of the partisan attachments of Hispanics, uh, is becoming more democratic. Good news for Barack Obama. Now, it's not a sure thing, actually, that in the end this is the Hispanic vote is going to be as dominantly democratic as it's been. As you can see in 2004, George W. Bush ran very well among Hispanics. Okay. And there are intense activities going on in this election and every other election uh, to try to attract an Hispanic vote. Why did Barack Obama appoint Sonia Sotomayor to the United States Supreme Court? It was an historic choice, and it was a very calculated choice uh, as well, given these figures. So the baseline partisanship of the electorate is, as I say, something of a challenge going into an advantage because of the way that the demography of the electorate is changing mark the electorate is changing and that the new generations, the new people coming into politics are more democratically oriented in their politics uh, than the preceding uh, generations have been. Finally, the last plus the, and the most significant plus for Barack Obama is that this year he's running as an incumbent. Okay. In every level of U.S. elections, from dog catcher to U.S. president, Running as an incumbent is worth a considerable amount in terms of the probability of the win and the vote share of the rolling win. There's been a fair bit of uh, empirical work on the incumbency advantage in presidential elections, and the number that is most often come, uh, come up with is that it's worth at least four percentage points. Four percentage points in the presidential elections is enormous, right? Four percentage points is the reason that George W. Bush won re-election in 2004, all by itself, right? Okay. And Barack Obama this year uh, has that advantage going into the election. Another way to see this is simply to ask the question, how often do incumbent presidents lose? And the answer actually is not very often. Okay. Since 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt was first elected, there have been 13 attempts by incumbent presidents for running for re-election. Ten of those attempts have been successes, 77%. And even if you take into account that Franklin Roosevelt accounts for three of those successes, okay, that just makes it eight out of 11, which is 73%. Okay, so incumbent presidents are enormously advantaged in elections. It's not clear exactly why, okay, but incumbent presidents like incumbent senators, like incumbent House members, uh, are very much advantaged in presidential election, uh, and that's something that gives Barack Obama a significant uh, edge uh, in this year's uh, presidential election. I'm going to skip over uh, Congress. I do expect uh, that there will be some changes in Congress. Uh, I would say that the Republicans will make significant gains in the Senate, probably to the point where they will control the chamber, and the Democrats will make gains actually in the House, but not to the point where they will take back control of the, of the chamber. Well, then what? Okay. What happens on November 7th after the election is decided? 
Well, I think that there are two scenarios. One is that Romney wins, which I think is the less likely, but not prohibitively unlikely possibility. And the other is if Obama wins. If Romney wins, there will be continued polarization. Nothing I've talked about is going to change the way that Congress is polarized, nor the way that the electorate is polarized. However, as I've also indicated, there's not going to be a knockout punch. If Romney wins the election, it will be by a very, very narrow margin. Okay, probably having had his party lose seats in the House of Representatives and gain seats in the Senate. Okay, no knockout punch. Mitt Romney, in order to get anything done, is going to require the cooperation of congressional Democrats. Congressional Democrats are going to be in no mood to cooperate with <coughs> President Romney, okay? Because, the way they see it, congressional Republicans have not cooperated at all with President Obama. They got away with it. Romney got elected as a result. Why should we cooperate with a Romney presidency? Moreover, things change when you're the party in power. Because now, you're the one in charge. <coughs> you're the one that voters hold accountable. And so, as a prediction, I would predict that if Romney is elected as president, the Republicans will see less urgency for debt reduction and spending cuts <laughs> than they currently see. It is one thing to lecture at the opposition president to do something that would be bad for the opposition president to do. It's another thing to actually be the party in power and do something that's bad for yourself. Okay, And that's what I would anticipate is that uh, the Republicans will uh, uh, kind of shift the rhetoric a bit and won't be quite so concerned about these matters. And that's because they will have full responsibility. The other reason is because a Romney president would produce uh, some strains on the Republican coalition, which goes back to the cohort partisanship that I showed you. When Ronald Reagan was, was uh, uh, from the standpoint of the Democrats, attacking Social Security in the early 1980s, who were the people who were drawing Social Security? They were the New Deal Democratic cohort. Okay, the elderly population that was drawing Social Security in the 1980s were the people who were born in the 19 teens and the 1920s, the people who were the most democratic cohort um, in the 20th century. And so Reagan essentially was hurting people who weren't going to vote for him anyway. Okay, that's not the case anymore. It's the baby boom generation that's the most Republican uh, um, cohort uh, in the 20th century, at least uh, since the New Deal. Um, and it would be exactly the baby boom generation uh, that will uh, be affected by any changes uh, in entitlements. So what happens if Obama wins? Well, once again, continued polarization, um, a mixed electoral verdict, and so nobody's going to stand around and sort of talk about a mandate, okay? That is, Obama would probably narrowly win re-election, Democrats pick up some seats in the House, lose the Senate. It's kind of hard to say, well, the voters have told, told us to do X. Uh, when it's not clear what the voters have done at all. However, there are some change uh, incentives, I think, uh, for the opposition party. Um, one is that uh, uh, from the standpoint of congressional Democrats, if you talk to them, uh, their view is that the strategy of congressional Republicans has been simply sabotage. Let's make sure that President Obama is not able to do anything to help him get reelected. Okay. Well, now, there's absolutely nothing that the congressional Republicans can do. They're going to affect whether Barack Obama is the next president or not, because Barack Obama will not be the next president if he is reelected in 2008, because he's term limited. Okay. And so there may be some additional incentives to cooperate, given that, uh, at least from what the Democrats would say, uh, that the situation has changed. More importantly, the prospect that we have a Democratic president with a Republican Senate and a Republican House increases the probability that we can come up with solutions where there is shared responsibility. Okay, where both sides can do things that are good for them and both sides have to do things that are bad for them. That's the grand bargain. Everybody knows that ultimately if the problems are going to be solved, it's going to be a grand bargain where taxes go up even though the Republicans don't want them to and when entitlements are reformed even though many Democrats do not. Moreover, Right after the uh, 2012 election is concluded, we will have necessity at our door. We have what I call the triple witching hour. Okay. The triple witching hour is that the Bush tax cuts expire, the alternative minimum tax fix expires, the payroll tax holiday expires, the mandatory spending cuts that were dictated by the debt ceiling agreement last August kick into effect, 
Okay, and sometime in the early spring, late winter, uh, we'll reach the debt ceiling limit. Okay, so all of a sudden, we have a situation where things have to change or things will change. And they will change in really, really significant ways. So here's the timeline. On January 1st, 2013, the budget tax cuts expire. On January 2nd, the automatic cuts from the debt reduction, uh, from the debt uh, ceiling agreement uh, kick into effect. And, and what do those uh, um, uh, mandatory cuts affect? They affect defense and non-defense -discre non discretionary spending disproportionately. That is, there are a whole bunch of entitlements over here, basically except for Medicare, entitlements are essentially exempted uh, from this agreement. So the significant cuts will be in the defense budget, okay? Defense Secretary Panetta has already said that they would be pretty uh, significant. They could have a very significant effect on uh, US uh, defense posture. Um, and likewise, defense seems, uh, tends to be a spending category where Republicans actually like the spending. Okay. So all of this is loaded up, essentially, to create a situation where the parties will either work together to solve this problem, or they're going to get an outcome automatically. Because of where the status quo point is now, they're going to get an outcome neither of them likes very well at all. And so, it is possible that from necessity, we in the United States might come together in spite of ourselves and in that way live up to the motto of the United States, a pluribus unum out of many. Thank you.